Okay. So, we had a showing this afternoon, and they were okay. You guys look a lot more better. <laughs> no, no, we're not pitting people against people. So, we start off with a cheers, though. So, cheers, everybody. Okay. Cheers. Thanks for coming tonight and being part of nature's journey tonight. So, yeah. So, these are, uh, I guess, basically my adventures over the last little bit. Um, now, I did release some images earlier this year in the fall time. Yes, Toronto gets to see some things for the first time, too. So, so there's three images that I'm going to share with you that you may have already seen in the galleries, okay? But these three were released. And then I'm going to go through and talk about <coughs> my six other new ones that are coming out tonight and about how I've journeyed through them and how the animals have journeyed through them as well, okay? So... Proud to be a Jay. Yes, wasn't it a great year for the Blue Jays? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. So this is part of the Corvid family. And Corvids, uh, they're a very smart family. That's your ravens and your crows and such. And Blue Jays are part of that family. They actually will sometimes mimic other birds. Uh, I actually read today that they'll mimic human voices, which I've never heard, but you never know. We know they're super territorial, right? If you have a feeder and you have a blue jay, any other birds come around? So yeah, they're not always the loved ones, I know. But, uh, they make so much noise. They make so much noise, yeah, that's right. Well, and that, I'm glad you bring that up because that noise is actually very important for a lot of other birds. What a lot of times they're doing is they're actually uh, warning other birds that there's a predator in the area. Hawks and owls will hunt these guys. And whenever there's a hawk or an owl, they'll totally be chirping away Yeah, if there's one in the area. So it, it helps the other birds out as well. One thing you might not know is that their feathers are not as brilliant blue as you see there. Um, what that is is, of course, every feather has like a tube where all the little feathers come off of, right? And that tube reflects light and creates this iridescent blue color that you see. So if you ever watch a blue jay on a, on a day where the sun starts to kind of fade away, it's going to look more drabby than when the sun is out. That, that tube actually really makes things look brilliant. So kind of a neat little thing about them. So anyway, that's proud to be a jay. And we have that one just around the corner over here. So you, you might have seen that already. Okay. Now we go on to mom continues her watch. And this will be related to, uh, to the, the blue jay. This is a little solid owl. And it's the most common owl in Canada. So all of you, no matter where you live, Calgary, whatever, you've probably had this individual come through your, your, your backyard. No word of a lie. If you hear something in the middle of the night, a C note on a piano played three times consecutively, so do, 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 that is a solid owl. It doesn't sound like that, by the way. Just in case you're wondering. That's not do, do, do. <laughs> Oh, my mom, she'd be so upset. I, I took piano lessons as a kid. I just couldn't handle it at all. But look at how it turned out as an artist. But, you, know, you got to get to the piano. I'm like, I want to go play out in the forest. No, go, you have to go to the piano. Anyway, okay, too much information. So mom's <laughs> continuing her watch, right? I'm like, wow, I'm putting this together now. This is good. Okay, so that's actually her back there, okay? They have amazing ability to rotate their necks. Yeah, 280 degrees. They can't turn them all the way around. And why that is, the eyes in their sockets are so large, they don't have much muscle attachment. So they really can't move their eyes. They have to be able to rotate their necks. So, so a lot of you might have Mum's Watchful Eyes, that piece, right? This is kind of the sequel to it. This is Mum Continues Her Watch. So, Now, this was up in northern Saskatchewan, and uh, I was involved with a fellow by the name of Terry. And he actually bans these little guys. He bans the little owlets and such. And so he took me on and he said, I don't think they'll be there anymore. I said, oh, I hope they're there, they're there. And he's like, I have one box that might be a little bit late. Now, we got to the bottom of that, that tree. <laughs> yeah, and that's her peeking her little head out. She's like, what are you guys doing here, eh, as we're making noise? And uh, he has these ladder things that you attach to the trunk. And it's only 30 feet up. And he's like, you go ahead and go get them down. I'm like, no way. <laughs> a little scared of heights. So the top of that box would come off. And inside would be the little owlets. And check out these little guys. Yeah. Not the cutest cute. thing you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not the cutest little thing you've ever seen. Mom's going, who are you? <laughs> but uh, yeah, and she had three. Okay, and that's pretty common for her to have a brood of three. And she'll hunt six to eight mice a day as she's keeping track of raising these, these little fellas. 
And, yeah, busy, busy, and nocturnal. She, for the most part, is hunting at night. So when I've had a sawwood owl through, through my backyard, I heard it in the backyard, and I got my flashlight out, and I went looking in the trees, and literally you saw two little eyes that were this far apart, and it was a sawwood up in the tree. They're tiny. They're just six inches tall. So, Now, getting back to the jay, if you are somewhere out in the forest and you hear all this racket of chickadees and jays, we said they're very noisy, right? If you hear jays and such and chickadees making a ton of noise, go over to that area. There will most likely be a little sawwood owl, northern pygmy owl, or some type of a little hawk. Yeah? They'll be mobbing, right? They're trying to tell everybody in the area, listen, there's danger over here, and they'll get you if you're not careful. Okay? How, how do they interact with other owls in, the, in one area? Do they start to stay away from other owls? Competition. Or? So they would fight with each other. So yeah, big owls chase. Won't, you won't be around. Big owls would be, they wouldn't be able to get these because they'd be too fast, uh, these yeah. little guys. Yeah. But yeah. they tend not to be in the same area? No, they would tend to be in the same area. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I think if it's a good hunting area, you're going to see lots of different species of owls there. It's so funny because I have the bigger ones, but I thought, no, no, maybe. Oh, in your, on your property? Yes. Yeah. Then there's going to be little guys. Okay. Yeah, I know in Fish Creek Park, when I photographed on the bright side, there was uh, two great horned owls in that immediate vicinity okay. as well. So, so, and I know in Ontario um, that there's a place uh, to the east of Toronto known as the Owl Forest. Mm -hmm. And they literally have six to seven different species of owls in that forest. Okay. Yeah. So that's a great question. I'm going to look that up. But why they would, there would be some type of benefit from all those owls living there together. Probably to get rid of predators as well. So, yeah. Okay. Obviously the human, human scent doesn't affect no, you're right. Yeah, the human scent does not. I mean, that's quite a myth with everything. Like, I've worked on snow geese and, you know, handling chicks and such and all that. Uh, the big thing with snow geese is you're walking through colonies of millions, and you'll have a trail of 20 goslings following you because they think your mom, right? So you put them all back in the nest and covering them with down and then running away as quick as you can. But no, and it's the same with fawns. Like, if you find a fawn out on the, on the land, don't pick it up and take it home. Mom just hit it there, and she's coming back for it. Yeah, yeah. But so no, do birds have much of a sense of smell? So maybe they don't. Uh, no, they have a bit of a sense of a smell, but it wouldn't be their best. You're right. Like it, their eyesight would be the, the number one. So yeah, good point. Yeah. And then I went on to fall time to Spirit of the River, and I released this one in Calgary. Okay, so Calgary got the first look at this. And uh, today I had a question from someone, uh, how many images do I take to get just that right one? Well, this was in the neighborhood of 1,200. Oh. Yeah, and luckily I don't shoot film anymore. <laughs> so I guess what I'm trying to say is back in the film days, you would have not been able to get an image like this. This uh, was titled Spirit Bear. She's a spirit bear, okay? So essentially that's a black bear with a white fur coat. There's only a thousand of them in the world. Okay, and BC's coast has them all, so we're very lucky. Um, they have genetics for white fur. It's not that they're albino, and so any black bear could mate with another black bear and produce white offspring. Or this mother might produce black offspring. It all depends what genes get together and such. Very unique. So Aboriginal uh, kind of legend is, is that the creator, Raven, painted every tenth bear white to remind humans of a time when the BC coast was covered in, in a land of ice and snow. Okay, 10,000 years ago. Your location is in Clem 2? This is, no, actually I did photograph the spirit bears at Clem 2, this one here, that was years ago. This yeah. is up near Prince Rupert now. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so. Just below, just above? Or? Uh, just below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she's in the river, and you know, you go on these trips, and <laughs> there's always pressure of, are you going to get the shot, are you going to get the shot, and this was the best trip ever, because I showed up, and in the first three hours, I got more spirit bears than I could imagine, I was like, woo, <laughs> this is awesome, so spirit bears fighting with black bears, all kinds of stuff, so it took a little pressure off to be able to experiment with some photography. Now, we had two days of really solid rains, it, it rains all the time out in the Great Bear Rainforest. And it's just so lush. I mean, the Great Bear Rainforest, if you haven't been, please go. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, so this river just swelled, and she had a hard time fishing. Now, I wanted to get the, the motion of that river, okay, and her staying completely still. Now, you might think, oh, that's easy. I'm going to show you a video. These bears are constantly aware, constantly checking out what's going on in that river because they want to catch a fish, right? 
This is one tenth of a second. All right. So. She never stops. Just the facial expression on her, it's amazing. Yeah. This only goes on for two hours, don't worry. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, she yawns. <laughs> She's going to be too, right? Yeah. Oh, you're sorry, Bart. Anyway, patience, patience. So, she literally sat there for two hours, I'm not lying. And I would just take photos and photos and photos and keep looking going, she didn't stay still. She didn't stand still. She didn't stand still. And finally, I thought I got a series where I was like, I think, one of them. And Spirit of the River was one of them. I felt bad for her. She had had easy fishing that first day. No issues at all, right? But eventually, of course... Oh, come on. But she's not underfed. No, oh. she's not. <laughs> no, look at her here. Yeah, she got uh, something that was coming up the river. This is hilarious. She had been there for two hours, never got a fish, wandered off, probably went down the river, maybe got a fish there, but to looked totally dejected. She came back a couple hours later, right? And she's wandering through. She comes to that exact same spot, walks in the river, boom, grab the fish. <laughs> so it was all luck of the draw. But if you watched her eyes, she is watching that river. And what researchers have found is that these spirit bears have a little bit easier time catching fish because the fish in the river are looking up, right? Oh. And yet yeah, they're looking at clouds a lot of times on the BC coast. And so a dark bear is going to be a shadow. A spirit bear is going to look like the clouds above. So there's a little bit of a selective advantage for spirit bears to do better than, than their black bear, uh, well, I guess, sub-cousins, so, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that they fight with black bears? Well, she, she was fighting over the spot in the river. Oh, there's constant fights in the river okay. as to who gets what spot. It's not white, it gets black, it's just... No, that's right. Yeah. Bears. Yeah, that's right. And so they have found that male spirit bears are a smidge, about 10 to 12% larger in body size than male black-colored black bears. Well, so, yeah, kind of neat. And of course, while you're out on the BC coast, oh, it's always raining. Yeah. <laughs> Want you to look at those rocks right there. Uh, yeah, I remember walking away from my tripod at one point to go grab a snack. You got to, oh, as a photographer, you really hate that when you walk away and you look back and there's your tripod slowly <laughs> doing that whole, yeah, boom, onto the rocks. And it's like, oh, it's only day two. But it still works, so thank goodness, yeah. Yeah, I'm a photographer, don't forget, okay, please? <laughs> I'm not a photographer. Yeah. Oh, that bear is right where I was sitting. <laughs> Those are the same rocks, yeah. So the individual with the orange on, that is one of our Aboriginal guides. Uh, the people with the yellow, the other people there were part of a film crew, okay? So there was a film crew that was out uh, filming the spirit bears uh, for Destination Canada. So, But these bears are so focused on the fish in the river, that they will walk up behind you. I was sitting there at one point and black bears came out and they were 10 or 12 feet behind. They're not gonna hurt you. They're focused on fishing, not focused on, on making us lunch or anything like that, so. And they're full. Yeah, and yeah. This is awesome, you have to watch this. This is one of the first days where the river wasn't flowing this fast, so a little easier fishing. Got it. <laughs> Watch what happens though. Oh, oh no! <laughs> oh, but he barely recovers it. <laughs> barely? Barely. <Fair, fair. laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> so he goes up into the forest now, and I, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the nature of thing at things uh, special where they talked about how important salmon are to the, the BC forests. So he'll go up there. They just really eat the fat tissue on the salmon when they're really good fisher bears because uh, they just want to get really plump for hibernation. 
And so they'll eat the skin and the rope, and then they'll come back down the river and they'll catch another one. All those nutrients end up going into those trees. And they've done studies where they look at the nitrogen levels in the trees. The trees are full of salmon. Those oh, trees yeah. are so lush because there's so much fertilizer from the dead salmon. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's really a neat little cycle, bears and, and the rainforest. So very important. Great news is that whole Great Bear Rainforest is protected from logging. Also, the Aboriginal peoples out there monitor those areas for poaching and all that all the time. Great. One of the sad things is, is that you know, we never know if these bears have the genetics that produce those spirit bears, and so black bears are not uh, protected in that area from being hunted. So that's a little bit of a concern, but biologists feel like things are okay so far. So that's good. Okay. And of course, while you're on the BC coast, you're going to see these big, awesome marine mammals. And uh, we would wake up in the morning in Hartley Bay, and you would look out onto the coast, and there would just be puffs of air coming up everywhere. And you could hear them. It was so silent some mornings. They're so vocal, these big humpbacks. Humpbacks are one of the most common whales in the uh, Pacific. If you look from the end of the uh, uh, gallery there to this end, that's how big they are. Okay, so 30, 40 meters, only 30,000 <coughs> kilograms. So you don't want to be taking one of those on with a kayak. Uh, they're not an orca, okay, so they're not a big predator. They're not known as, or orcas are known as wolves of the ocean, right? These guys are filter feeders. So what they're going to do is they're going to do something called bubble net feeding. They'll go down, they'll do a dive, and they'll create all these different types of bubbles in the water and it'll get all the krill to kind of mash together in a big kind of ball, and then they take turns coming up and feeding in that ball and straining the water out. So when they're really feeding, there'll be a ton of, of uh, seagulls and such, and the waters will be full. Krill are orange in color, and there'll be lots of orange color in, in the water and such as they're feeding on krill. So they filter, they strain. When you see these big flukes, they're doing a deep dive, and that's what they're going down to do. They're either gonna sleep, They'll do a deep dive through their sleeping because obviously when they're doing this, they're still sleeping, right? Either they're doing a deep dive to, to continue sleeping or they're going after their food. They'll go down 150 meters and they can be down for 30 minutes. So when you're photographing them, you're kind of going, how long until these guys get back up? <laughs> anyway, and the tail fluke, that's pretty much the Pacific salute, right? When you're there, that's, uh, that's what a lot of times you see of whales. It's just their, their tails, so, okay? I'm going to show you Pacific Salute. Uh, Spirit of the River is at the back, and Mums uh, continues her watches at the front on the easel. And I'll go unveil Pacific Salute. We'll do our first draw for our $25 gift certificate, okay? So this is Pacific Salute. Pacific Salute. Now we're going to head over to the mountains, and I'm going to release some of the most recent adventures that I've had in the mountains, okay? So this summer, you know, I started off my, my whole career, I did a master's in biology, as some of you I'm sure know, on Arctic fox. How, how's, it, how's this going, by the way? Is everybody done? Are you guys ready to be over? No. no? Yeah, okay, all right. Hey, I haven't got a question yet. I told you you have to ask questions. <laughs> no, I'm just like, okay. All right. So I did a master's in biology on Arctic Fox. And uh, you know, when I started photography, it was all about wildlife. And slowly over time, I started doing more and more landscapes as you can, can see and such. And then you get out to the Rockies here and you go, holy cow, everything is a photo. Mm -hmm. Well, last summer I, I took my first hike ever, I know I'm embarrassed to say, but up to O'Hara. And I couldn't get on the bus that morning. And so I was like, I gotta get the morning light. So I was out of my truck at five and going down that road as fast as I could and hiking, 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 only to get there and go, uh, you didn't really have to get here for sunrise because it's so vast that there's no sun to see right now. 
So I'm walking down the trail and doing a little bit of photography and what happens? This guy comes down the trail with a point and shoot camera. And he goes, look at what I got. And he showed me on 